All right, I have uh, noon in the Eastern Time Zone in Laurel, Maryland, and it is time to begin our webinar. I'm so pleased to have you join us today. Uh, this is uh, the Impact of Emerging Technology on Society series. It is co-presented by Capital Technology University and our um, partner in this, the Baltimore Sun. And we're very pleased to have you join us today in this session. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the role of machine learning in emerging computing systems and capabilities. And this will be presented by Dr. Robert J. Steele. I will introduce Dr. Steele in just a little bit. Let's cover the agenda that we're gonna to use today and then we'll get right into the presentation. Uh, but we'll begin with just a few slides having to do with Capital Technology University. Obviously, some of you who are Capital alums or faculty members, or in the case of uh, Maxwell, who is one of our current students, you know quite a bit about us. But uh, just for those that may not know a lot about us, since this is a partnership with the Baltimore Sun, we'll have just a little bit about that. Then I'll introduce the presenter and we'll get right into the presentation. The bulk of our time together is the presentation. We'll make sure that we have time for questions and I'll cover that in just a little bit. And uh, then I'll, at the end, after the presentation is over and all the questions are answered, uh, talk about upcoming webinars, both in this series and in another series that Capital presents in webinars, and then we'll be done. Okay, now uh, let's just talk just very briefly about who Capital is, what we stand for, what we're all about. Uh, there are three words that define us very well, nonprofit, private, and accredited. We are uh, a nonprofit, uh, university based in Laurel, Maryland. We are private, one of the few private universities, and I'll talk about this in a moment, that focuses on this, on uh, everything having to do with technology. Uh, and we are accredited. Uh, we have accreditation uh, with the Middle States Commission on Higher Education, which is our regional accreditation. And for those of you that uh, know and understand accreditation in the United States universities, uh, strive to have the highest level of accreditation, which is regional accreditation, and that is what we have. Uh, we have the highest level of accreditation available to any university in the United States. We're also authorized by the state we, we are located in, the state of Maryland, to confer uh, degrees all the way from associate's degree right up to doctoral degrees. We're an award-winning institution. We were honored to recently be named as the, having the best cybersecurity higher education program in the United States um, by the 2020 SC Media, by being presented the 2020 SC Media Award. We're the only independent college in Maryland dedicated to engineering, computer science, information technology, and the management and business of technology. And we'll be talking about the computer science part a great deal today. Now, uh, just a few session pointers. We'll answer questions at the conclusion of the presentation, but actually we invite you to type in your questions at any time in the text chat. We'll try to answer just as many questions as we have. We do finish in 60 minutes, so we may not get to every question, but we'll answer just as many as we have. We're not activating webcams or microphones for the audience today, so the way that you will communicate is, with us is through the text chat. Uh, we will be sending a link to the recording and to the slides that uh, to all registrants, and that will be also available on our webinars webpage. And for those of you that are not watching this live, but who will be watching it on demand, we'll also issue a, uh, upon your request, a, a participation certificate that's available by request for both live session and on demand viewers. We'll talk just a little bit more about that certificate at the conclusion of the webinar. And of course, we always encourage uh, you to let us know how we are doing. Now, let me introduce our presenter, Dr. Robert J. Steele. And let me get out my notes so that I do this correctly. Our presentation today is called The Role of Machine Learning in Emerging Computing Systems and Capabilities and is presented by Dr. Steele. Uh, Dr. Robert Steele serves as chair and professor of the computer science department here at Capital Technology University. He holds a PhD in computer science and has authored more than 140 peer reviewed scholarly publications. And his work has been patented and uh, has been successfully commercialized. 
He also has extensive administrative experience in large and complex institutions nationally and internationally and at all levels of program leadership, curriculum, development, and teaching. Welcome, Dr. Steele. I'm going to take my slide share off at this point so that you can take over. We're just very pleased to have you join us. Bill, thank you very much uh, for the introduction and uh, uh, welcome everybody. Glad to uh, see a good uh, good group here today. So I'm gonna share my slides and get into this presentation. Okay, so as, as per the title, the role of machine learning uh, in emerging computing systems and, and capabilities. Uh, when I originally uh, conceived this uh, presentation a couple of months ago, it was uh, you know, intended to be almost a uh, kind of a state of the art research presentation, but I see that our, that our audience today is, uh, is a mixed group. I mean, we have uh, high school students, uh, community college, uh, you know, se seasoned workers. So I'm going to uh, kind of pitch this presentation at a, at a kind of a, a more broad and uh, explanatory uh, level in this, in this area. So this is the, the, the structure that we're, we're going to follow. And I do actually encourage questions uh, at, any, at any time. Uh, feel free to put them into the chat and uh, maybe I'll, I'll check with uh, Bill as we go along and I'm happy to answer them. Uh, or uh, I'll get to the end of the section there called the big picture and before discussing about applied research, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions at that point. So the overview, um, career pathways, um, literally I'm going to refer to what we may call a, a jobs boom uh, in artificial intelligence. I'm going to explain what that means. Uh, I'm going to talk about machine learning and artificial intelligence in general. Uh, I'm going to talk about what somebody needs to know if they uh, want to do these areas, not just uh, you know discuss them, but uh, actually uh, uh, participate, uh, lead these areas. Um, and then I think maybe interestingly, the emerging directions in this space, and hence why there is there is uh, momentum behind what is happening here. It's not going to end in a few years. It's going to uh, uh, roll on for at least uh, a decade or two. I would. I would uh, anticipate. So let me let me just throw this introductory slide in by way of explanation for what I mean in terms of a jobs boom in artificial intelligence. Um, you know, I, I cite a number of uh, average salaries there, a number of roles, and and just note there at the bottom of that slide, I, I do provide a a citation, as it were of the exact source of that from 2020 data, 2019 data. These are not hyperbolic numbers. These are, these are publicly available numbers. Um, and uh, if you look at these set of roles here, if you look at any list of the top 10 or top 20 uh, jobs in the country or internationally at the moment, uh, these are all pretty much there and they make up a good proportion of the, of the top set. Um, and I'll explain a little bit about these terms as I, as I work through this presentation, but um, machine learning engineer, okay? It's not a traditional job title. Uh, you know, we have uh, job titles like software engineer or um, electrical engineer. Machine learning engineer is newer. It's a little bit more advanced. Um, and, uh, you know, the name at this point in time in the development of this uh, field is uh, roughly synonymous with artificial intelligence engineer. We, we could uh, debate the, the exact definitions of these. Um, various uh, uh, aggregating sites would list this as the, as the best job in the US, both in terms of uh, growth rates, uh, pay, and uh, quantities of job. Data scientists, another term uh, closely related. I would think most people have heard of that term Again, a very well remunerated role, um, famously uh, ranked as the sexiest job of the 21st century by the Harvard Business Review. I believe Forbes has ranked as the number one job in the country uh, four years in a row. But just to kind of cut into some of the content that's going to come up, data scientist and machine learning engineer are 
extremely adjacent roles. They're overlapping. It maybe just uh, varies in terms of the emphasis you place on, on one aspect or another. Computer vision engineer, um, according to uh, Indeed, uh, the, the median pay is 158,000 for these roles. Computer vision engineer, again, is what you probably consider a non-traditional career name. Um, it's, it's not as well known as civil engineer or a computer scientist. Uh, but again, it is closely aligned with, with, the role, with the roles just mentioned above. Semiconductor engineer, um, again, uh, a very important role at this point. If you were to look at this whole set of, of, of uh, occupations listed here, the, the most odd one out would be semiconductor engineer. This is somebody who um, engineers the, the hardware or the uh, silicon chips uh, that we use for various of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning applications. Um, you would best to study something like computer engineering if you wish to be a semiconductor engineer. However, and I'll talk about this in the presentation, uh, there is a, a close intermingling of the activities of computer engineers and computer scientists uh, at this time, probably more so than a couple of decades, in the last couple of decades. Data engineer, again, not a, a title that everybody, I think, in the community knows. It's a very important role. Um, as we find that we're using data to do these uh, applications in relation to machine learning, somebody has to marshal that data. And we're not just talking gigabytes. This could be terabytes. This could be even exabytes is, uh, you know, the current status of the, of the uh, kind of uh, leading edge of, of data capacities, that's a billion, a billion in terms of bytes or, or whatever uh, unit you're talking about. Uh, the person who can bring that data together um, across multiple data sources, um, integrate it together, uh, pre-process it, it turns out to be a very complex job um, and almost the make or break step in all of artificial intelligence. A lot of important steps, but that one's pretty critical. Um, enterprise architect uh, is uh, another role that is a little bit, uh, has a longer lineage of, of, of recognition. It's uh, uh, similarly, it is somebody who understands how to uh, organize the data across a whole organization or possibly across multiple organizations. So this is quite a confluence of many exciting career paths. A lot of them sound kind of new. So I guess the question I'm going to try to pose in this talk is what is going on? What is what is driving, driving all of this? So let's do that by just going back, um, going back to basics. Uh, and I'm literally going to cover some definitions here, not not um, precisely, but just so that we understand, um, you know, what are the relationships between these terms. So machine learning. Okay, we're going to uh, hopefully elaborate a little bit on what that what that is today, but um, you know, probably the, the key concept of machine learning is that it, uh, it takes many examples from the past from, you know, from, from data sources that we use um, and it determines relationships between various parts of the data automatically. It, it, it doesn't, traditionally we write the code if we're a, Python programmer, we handcraft every piece of code. If we wanted to do uh, any application area, we have to write uh, the logic that we're looking for. Machine learning kind of goes meta. That is, it is a type of software which you just show it examples and it calculates the functions or methods or relationships. So it's literally a meta, almost going meta in terms of computing. Computer science, I'm not going to dwell on that. Artificial intelligence uh, and, and data mining. To answer what is the relationship between these, I'm just going to flip through the next slide to just kind of explain the taxonomy that we're, we're dealing with. Um, each of these little dot points here is probably worth an entire university course, at least a one hour lecture. So I'm going to be brief. Um, it's complex in some ways, but Computer science, uh, we, we, we have a pretty good, uh, I think, understanding of this. It is around 70 odd years old. Artificial intelligence 
actually began as a subfield of computer science about three years later some computer science professors uh, kind of try to formalize the idea of artificial intelligence so what is it it is literally trying to replicate or emulate human intelligence level um, uh, aspects at um, via via uh, via computer via silicon based computer or digital computer it doesn't have to be digital computer machine learning uh, what happened with the artificial intelligence field is that it had a very broad goal. Um, what happened in the subsequent decades was that it was split up into various parts of human activity that each in themselves turns out to be massively challenging. The machine learning aspect, which we're dwelling on today, happens to be replicating the actual cognitive, or at least trying to emulate the behavior of the cognitive processing and thinking that a, that a human does. Okay, obviously, a big deal. Computer vision tries to replicate um, uh, a person's ability uh, to see uh, see images in front of them and to understand what are those images. For example, seeing a picture of a person in front of you, uh, you know, we inherently know that that's a, a person or we know that's a car or we know that's a dog, but how would a computer do that? So that's a big area that's several decades old. Natural language processing refers to how to understand written or verbal language. Natural language here means like human spoken language, like English is a natural language, Chinese is a natural language. So that is another subfield actually of artificial intelligence. Um, and it is uh, a vast area of activity on itself, of its own. Information retrieval uh, happens to refer to um, uh, from a large uh, textual data set, retrieving things of interest to a particular request or query, i.e. this is the foundation of search engines, okay? So uh, search engines like Google and others, they, they draw from, from this space. Um, so you'll see, uh, and then you'll see at the bottom there, computer engineering, which I think you would classify as a relatively separate, um, you know, separate uh, field but I'll talk about the relationships at the moment. Uh, under machine learning, we have a, uh, a lot of the fundamental uh, concepts of machine learning were developed in the 80s and 90s. In fact, many of the things we use now were developed then. So what's happening now? Well, there was a technological um, step forward in the early 2000s, 2010s called deep learning amongst other, amongst other things. And uh, these happen to take the idea of neural networks, which is one type of uh, machine learning model, um, and make them a whole lot deeper and a whole lot bigger and, uh, and, and more complex. It just turns out that uh, that got very interesting results when run on the, uh, on the sufficiently strong hardware, such that uh, we're finding many um, results in this, in, in this space that exceed a human human judgment, uh, measurable human judgment levels. Okay, so that's where there's a little bit of excitement uh, coming in in this space in at least the last 10 years, particularly probably in the last five, five to 10 years. So, no, I'm not, I'm, this is a slide I, I sometimes put in here, but why, the, I'm trying to explain why um, there is going to be, uh, this is going to roll on for, for some time with, with high impact. If you look at what's happened from, from computer science as a whole in the last several decades, again, starting only about 70 years ago, um, if you look at the uh, seven of the top 10 companies in the world ranked by market capitalization are essentially now computer science-based companies. So uh, a lot of those uh, companies you, you've heard of as daily names, um, some of them may, maybe not, um, they're all extremely impactful uh, and what we're facing at the moment is a wave of innovation that um, is at least as large as the wave of innovation that led to these companies. So to, just to give you an idea of, of why, even to quote the, you know, the, the, the typical career salaries, I think understates um, you know, what, is, what, what is about to happen technologically. 
in these spaces. Um, here is probably a, an interesting way, way to look at it. Uh, I would think at this point, uh, it would not be unreasonable to think that these artificial intelligence technologies that we'll talk a little bit more about today uh, will have at least as much impact as the internet or the, or the World Wide Web. And just as a recap for the younger in, in the audience, that the World Wide Web in a, in, a, in a mainstream commercial form only came into existence about 20 years ago in the, in the late 1990s. Um, in the late 1990s, such companies as Google, Amazon, Facebook, Twitter didn't exist at all. So you can see that, um, you know, that within, within a very short period of time, these companies are, are amongst the, the very most uh, influential, I guess you would say at the moment. Uh, and maybe another perspective on this. Um, you know, there is, a, there is a, a concept of something called a general purpose technology, a technology that when it rolls out will not impact just one industry sector, but all industry sectors. So uh, those who look into this type of uh, analysis have uh, identified 24 general purpose technologies in all of history we're talking about in the history of, of uh, humankind. Uh, dating back to such innovations as the wheel, the steam engine, electricity, including the internet, um, and then artificial intelligence is, is placed amongst those um, peers as, as, as being potentially significant. So, you know, you can, as you listen to this today, you can kind of analyze for yourself what you think uh, may be happening. And I'm also happy to answer questions on this. Um, uh, a lot of the parts of uh, a lot of sectors of industry are already um, getting on board and, and, and looking to how to use these technologies, which is why, um, really why you see those high salaries. The high salaries represent, um, you know, a, a supply and demand issue. The, the biggest bottleneck, in fact, in artificial intelligence, almost kind of paradoxically, is human intelligence or skilled human workforce. Uh, it's not actually computational power, it's not even software. Um, the the skill set you have to have in, uh, in in this space is highly attainable, but it's definitely the case that um, we are well under well underserved, which is, I guess, the nature of this this presentation. I'm just uh, making the audience aware that uh, there is a um, uh, there is a uh, there is a golden uh, wave just there at the moment and. Uh, it is worth understanding exactly how you can partake in that. So as, as artificial intelligence and machine learning become utilized in, in various sectors, you'll see even here in the DC area, um, you know, some significant developments. Uh, one of those significant developments is the uh, Department of Defense Joint Artificial Intelligence Center. It's got about a $1 billion budget per year and uh, they are particularly focused on applying artificial intelligence into defense and into military. Um, as you can imagine, this is an extremely uh, fraught and, uh, and uh, an approach, uh, an undertaking that has to be handled very um, carefully uh, and very uh, wisely. Um, but it's uh, nevertheless, the, the, the workforce that needs to contribute to that does not yet exists, certainly not in, in large proportion. Um, similarly, uh, you have Amazon uh, setting up their second uh, HQ here in, uh, in Virginia, in Washington. Um, that, uh, you know, uh, applying machine learning, applying artificial intelligence is definitely one of the preeminent uh, foci of, of Amazon and all of the other big big tech companies. Um, similarly, uh, National Security Agency, uh, other big employers, uh, Capital One, NASA Goddard. Also, I would note that um, these technologies are being used in all sectors. So they're being used in healthcare, they're being used in uh, government. Um, and I, if, if we have time during this um, presentation, I may move it to another session uh, for, for another, another date. But uh, I'll start to talk about some very specific applications of machine learning into some of these very diverse areas. 
kind of hopefully convey just how easy it is, not easy, but how, how many options there are to really make huge impacts into how industries work with nothing more than uh, know-how and, uh, and at least moderate computational resources. Uh, and maybe a final point from this slide, you'll see that I think you'll find within the US that there will be uh, an absolutely critical need to train uh, more uh, of these uh, individuals for the reason of the, the long-term trend in this space and also just these immediate employer uh, needs that we, we identify here. This is uh, like a, a smattering of, of what's actually, actually going on. Um, and there'll be a lot of uh, need for training domestic and, uh, and, and uh, internationally as well, but um, certainly there will need to be more domestic uh, training here in the US. Um, so that's kind of the overall scope of what is, uh, you know, what is, what is the setup for this field? How long will this, uh, this wave of artificial intelligence last? I think you can safely say it's going to be uh, a decade or more. And I guess I'll elaborate a little bit why that why that is. Um, so the question is, if you're a, a high school student, if you're a community college student, if you're a uh, in person working already in industry, um, what do you actually need to know uh, to, to participate and not just discuss it? Another point I want to make during this presentation is that you know, the term artificial intelligence has a lot of um, a lot of connotations towards uh, around it. It's uh, considered to be almost uh, mysterious about what it could and could not do and what its limits are. I mean, to be kind of give an interesting perspective on it, you know, when, when you're talking about when an artificial, you know, what we would call an artificial intelligence system currently runs, what it involves is carrying out a large number of uh, linear algebra and, and calculus-based operations on, on, a, on a massively parallel chip architecture. So just to, just to bring it back to reality, that's what artificial intelligence looks like. It's very, like any computer software, it's, uh, it's just a remarkable thing that what is very mundane in terms of its atomic actions uh, literally in terms of uh, a lot of artificial intelligence applications, it would be a equivalent of matrix operations, uh, you know, the idea of, of mathematical matrices, um, uh, but just carried out at such a rate um, uh, on, on sufficiently parallelized hardware uh, that the effects are some of the end goals I mentioned a minute ago, which is beyond human level judgment or human level evaluation of, of situations or of images or or, 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 uh, or language, so that's that's the difference between the, the the abstract concept of what artificial intelligence could be and uh, you know what it what it actually uh, is how it is actually implemented. So let's just talk about where these where these uh, machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence ideas are, are actually having a uh, you know a a significant impact. So. Famously, um, around about 2015, uh, particular, uh, particular uh, types of machine learning, these are, again, examples of, uh, of deep neural networks, something called convolutional deep neural networks. Um, on a standard uh, a test bed of images was found to exceed the best image recognition that uh, that a human could do. And uh, so how do we do that? We, we would literally say we have uh, tens of thousands of images, uh, say some of them involve uh, a cat, some of them involve a car, some of them involve a person. Um, say if you showed all of those images to a, uh, to a person or multiple people and asked them to identify where's the, where's, the, where's the car in that image? What car is it? What type of car is it? Um, what person is that? You know, is there a person there? Whatever the specific question is. And you would find that if a person were to look at, or people were to look at tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of images, um, 
they won't get all of them correct. Why? Because some of them are ambiguous. Say there was a picture of a, um, of a tree, but the, the, the picture was, was so close to the, the bark of the tree that it, it became, you know, essentially indistinguishable. Maybe it, it looks dark or something like that. So it is a picture of a tree, but it's beyond um, even human judgment to uh, kind of uh, conclude that that's a picture of a tree. If, if it was a tree taken from, um, you know, from a, from a reasonable distance and you can see its general structure, a trunk and, and leaves and so forth, uh, any person would be able to identify that, that that's a tree. So what was done with these benchmarks was that, um, you know, we, there were people who went over these and manually identified uh, exactly what are the content, all of those images. And then that became a benchmark and then they set about developing training and evaluating uh, you know, what we would call machine learning models or they could be called artificial intelligence models to see how good they were um, at identifying all of those images, trees, people, whatever. Um, and uh, using those underlying technologies um, of, uh, of deep learning, it was found that um, these models uh, started to exceed and be more accurate than, than even a human uh, per, uh, you know, peruser of those images um, about five years ago. And they, can, and they continue to, to, to uh, go further ahead. So it is that, is that kind of tipping point that, that kind of um, sparked a, a lot of interest. Uh, if we can have uh, machines do certain tasks that um, could only previously be done by a person, uh, but doing it better than a person, um, then it's very suggestive of what happens if we keep extending what's in those software models and you know, what strength of hardware, what uh, power of hardware we're running uh, these, these systems on. So um, that's, kind of the, that's kind of the impetus of the current um, uh, headlong rush in this space. And uh, let me put it this way. Another thing that was shown is that the step up from neural networks in the 1990s to the 2010s was heavily dependent on a couple of things. One thing was greater processing power um, and hence uh, the level of complexity of network that could be run uh, was far beyond what it was before. It would have been impractical to do that in the 1990s. Also, again, greater, greater data uh, sets available, uh, more uh, prevalent, what's called labeled data sets, larger labeled data sets. Um, and there were some very important uh, software innovations there as well. But, you know, the, the, basic, uh, the basic moral from what's happening is that it looks like as long as you speed up the machines, um, sufficiently and you have, uh, what shall we say, um, sophist sufficiently smart machine learning algorithms, you will continue to increase in the intelligence um, of, of that software. Um, so you, you can imagine there's a lot of applica applications of computer vision. I mean, I could, uh, you have the chat here, I could, if I was giving a lecture, I would certainly, um, I was certainly ask about it. Um, a couple of questions, and I'll get to those a little. They will. I will get to those questions exactly. So, I mean, what what would be a, a useful application of computer vision? So, there's there's a lot already to give a to give a, a health related one. For example, uh, these computer vision technologies are used to um, analyze um, uh, radio. Uh, you know. Uh, radiologist uh, data, for example, x-rays or CAT scans to detect um, as well as a, uh, in fact, better than a, than a medical specialist could, um, whether there's the, the presence of disease or cancer or other, um, you know, other uh, things that are of, of, of great, uh, of great, um, I see somebody has, raise their hand. I don't know if they want to ask a question. Zylon. Um, yes, go ahead. 
Hi, we are not uh, enabling microphones. So if you do have a question, just type it into the text chat. You have to be typed, yeah. So while, uh, while our participant uh, puts that in, uh, the, the, the bottom line is that being able to, um, to do uh, image processing better than a human is, has, has, a, has a lot of uh, significance. For example, the next stop point there, autonomous vehicles. So we hear a lot about autonomous vehicles. Um, there's nothing, there's nothing uh, revolutionary about autonomous vehicles other than the deep learning component, okay? What this means is that the vehicle using cameras on board the vehicle as it travels down the road, receives those images or that video and literally applies um, uh, a machine learning model to do exactly what I'm describing. It looks at uh, some configuration of pixels ahead and says, that's a stop sign. That's an oncoming car. That's the median strip. That's a uh, unexpected obstacle on the road. Um, and that is literally the technology that is driving autonomous vehicles. In theory, we're gonna to get to the situation where, um, literally get to the situation where potentially uh, cars can, can, can drive uh, by just look at uh, using these machine learning techniques. So, Zylon, can we work in a medical area as a computer scientist? Um, you, Medical area will be hiring unlimited machine learning engineers. Um, absolutely, you, you can. Um, doctors, uh, I don't think any doctors will um, be on, will be up to speed with the sort of technologies we're talking about. What tends to happen is that, um, uh, you know, a, a data scientist or a machine learning engineer works in conjunction with domain experts, okay? The domain expert could be a doctor in the medical case. It could be, a, you know, a, a, an automotive engineer in the case of autonomous vehicles. It could be um, a security expert in the case of uh, you know, something like malware detection and so forth. Uh, I'm not sure if I got the, that was the uh, question from the that was That was Arlen's question. Um, William asked the question, can be used in the automotive industry for image processing on the road. Exactly. So exactly. That's the answer that, um, that I was just um, kind of uh, pontificating on. So there's a lot happening there. It, it, it's um, that, that in itself is going to transform many, many industries. Autonomous vehicles, just one of them. Uh, natural language processing. Again, this is an old area dating back, uh, you know, 50 odd years. Uh, but Again, around 2015 on benchmark data sets, they found that these emerging machine learning technologies um, exceeded human performance. So now, um, at least in theory, you can uh, get to the point where uh, the machine, the computer can understand the, 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 language, you're, the language you're using in English or, or any other language, frankly, um, as well as a human um, uh, conversant with you. So, I mean, just one of the, that has a lot of implications, but just one of them is real-time automated language translation. So, I don't know if you've looked around, but such systems are, are already there in, uh, in uh, at least in a non-perfect non form, but we're talking about the ability to say a sentence in English and to have it come out of your um, smartphone or whatever device you have in Spanish in real time, and then the person to respond in Spanish, and then you to hear them in English. So, um, as you can imagine, the implications of that are, are quite profound in themselves. And this is a this is this is another um, a big impactful area. But it's also you know, even even the ability that's kind of an exciting aspect of it. But even the ability to read through text on the web or handwritten text and understand what it says is, is a big deal as well. So I don't know, those who, who pay attention, this have probably seen many examples of such things as um, sentiment analysis, it's called sentiment analysis. Uh, for example, uh, if you were to look at tweets or some other social media postings, um, a way to automated, uh, automated assessment of is, is the tweet positive or is it negative? Is it critical or is it supportive? Um, 
automating that, automating that um, semantic analysis of written language um, is already widespread. Um, it is definitely an area of great interest to a lot of the big tech companies, including Amazon, including Facebook. Um, and uh, it's also the basis, of course, for your smart home devices. So for example, we all know about Alexa or Siri. When you say, you know, Alexa, do X, or when you pose a, a complex question, um, that essentially involves, uh, you know, it doing real time natural language processing um, and then uh, converting that into the appropriate specific um, instruction for uh, the appropriate specific instruction for a um, for a given action. Okay, it could be a simple action, but as this gets stronger and stronger, the ability to do um, complex conversational or really realistic conversation with devices is, is definitely going to be there. Um, here's another, here's another a big one. And, and just to give you an idea of why, why this field is not going to go away in 10 years or 20 years, almost the most uh, stunning aspect is that we're talking about predicting the future, not completely, but in narrow, sub problems with a greater or less accuracy, um, we're in increasingly being able to predict the future better, again, using these advanced machine learning technologies. So you might ask, you know, what's the value of being able to predict the future? I think you can, I think everybody, when they hear that, they can understand that if your company or your country can predict the future and others cannot, uh, that's gonna be a big deal. It's going to be a big deal. Does that mean you can, uh, DeAndre, I think, has a question. Let's have a look here. I see a question here first from Barney. Um, I've turned the, heard the term AGI, artificial general intelligence. Is there a difference with AI? I think uh, somewhat. Artificial general intelligence is referring to really trying to replicate a human's capability on a, on a holistic uh, way. For example, a, a machine that, that could replicate like a person and, and converse and do, uh, do things that are uh, you know, across the board. Reality is that the success in artificial intelligence has all come through targeting specific problems. Back in the 1990s, that was playing chess. And then around 1998, machine learning beat the world chess champion. I think it was Kasparov or something like that. So everyone was excited. Uh, then uh, machine learning beat the world Go champion. And now a machine learning beats human level speech recognition and image recognition. So it's, it's increasingly a taking subdomains of human intelligence, targeting them with these specific technologies and, um, and, and performing as well. Um, so you do see a kind of a general trend towards taking in broader human capabilities, but at this point, the real success comes from um, from specific uh, things, from specific uh, application areas. So this predicting the future is a, is a big deal. Okay, this applies to anything, and I'll just give a, a further comment on that in a minute. But the key the key point is this that. The, the nature of machine learning is that for any given set of input attributes, input data, it can predict some output data. It can basically automatically find the relationship between any set of data elements and another an other data element or elements. If that data, if that latter data element represents something in the future, literally the same techniques at a fundamental level that allow you to classify an image as containing a tree, they're, they're almost identical as the technologies allowing you to predict the future. So I, I don't know if people get that idea, but it's the same, obviously the way you implement it for a specific model and, and, the, and the data sets are all different. But if you can find, if you have an automated way to find relationships between input attributes and output attributes, if you choose the output attributes to be future uh, reflections of the future, then 
you'll be able to predict the future. Just to give a, a concrete example of what I mean by that. Um, for example, when a patient checks into hospital, if you collect 50 attributes from them, demographics, a condition, diagnoses, comorbidities, and then the output attribute is, um, will they, you know, for example, um, you know, die within the hospital or will they stay more than 10 days in the hospital? Uh, and you train that model on uh, many thousands, hundreds of thousands of past patients, uh, you'll find that the model and typically, and, and we've, some of our research includes this, has the ability to predict with very high accuracy what would happen for any future potential patient. So if another patient were to come in and you would look at their 50 attributes, and then the, the output attribute of the model is what will be their outcome? And will they, will, they, will they take a long time to leave hospital? Will they die in hospital? Um, those models will, will predict the future. Another example of that is uh, models have been built that take a, a blood sample and literally predict your life expectancy just from a blood sample. How do we know? Um, it's basically by taking many, many hundreds of thousands of blood samples uh, where you know the outcome for that individual person's uh, lifespan um, and then just uh, basically uh, ingesting those into machine learning models of the right nature and that would actually be able to predict, for example, life expectancy. Conceptually, it's extremely trivial, um, but it's, uh, it will be a, it's applicable to all, all problem domains. And I'll mention one other kind of exciting uh, development here. Um, there's, a, there's a space that builds on top of deep learning, something called a generative adversarial networks. Um, and uh, you know, the, interesting, uh, the interesting kind of technological or conceptual change with those is that you have two machine learning models competing against each other, okay? So if you can wrap your head around that, let me, let me give you a, a specific example. Um, you have, uh, you have a, a set of pictures of, of people and you feed it to a, a model, machine learning model that's meant to determine if that is a, is a, a real photograph. You have another network which generates um, random, uh, not random, it, it generates um, artificially um, created photos that uh, are meant to fool the other model into, into who is checking if it's real. So for example, the, the kind of the uh, evaluator network will see pictures come to it. One is real photo, another is a photo uh, of, uh, that's generated artificially, doesn't exist. It's not, not a real person, it's just made through digital um, creation, okay? These models can be configured in a way that is a feedback loop, whereas the, uh, almost like an arms race, as the, as the, the, the generative model creates uh, more realistic photos, uh, the, 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 the evaluation model uh, ups its ante to, to be better at discerning what is the, a fake photo and, and so forth. The, the end result of that, and this is already uh, an existing technology, is that you can um, literally generate uh, lifelike pictures of people, of countryside, lifelike music, videos, um, and going beyond that, uh, there's an interest now in trying to understand exactly how those uh, novel images and video are being like how would you control uh, as an outside user can, can control that, um, that novel creativity as it were. They're coming completely from, a, they're completely from the computer's mind as, you, as, as it were. Uh, so it's, um, it is, this particular area has a lot of adjacency to the question of computer-based creativity. So you're just a couple steps away here from machines generating music, generating art, generating writing, generating pictures. Uh, so this is a very, very hot area. Um, you know, is it as useful as being able to predict the future? Well, depends. It, 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 it's certainly important. Uh, it, it could, for example, revolutionize art. It could revolutionize entertainment and it probably will. So even on the, on the even if you were to take the artificial intelligence and take the subsector called artificial intelligence applied into graphics or entertainment or art, this will be huge. Okay, so to, to look ahead, 
if you were to look at a, you know, an, an art or fine arts degree in, in 10 years time, they'll be talking about generative adversarial networks and their content will be updated to reflect uh, what is happening here, which again, I think, you know, it's demonstrative of the fact that these types of technologies are essentially unlimited in the sector in which they impact. It could be fine art, it could be health, it could be, um, you know, it could be any of these, any of these areas. autonomous vehicles, as I've mentioned, uh, uh, finances, okay, and just predicting the future in terms of uh, financial markets is, of course, an area that uh, whenever I give my students a, uh, a data mining task, that's usually the one that they they alight upon. It's a it's a very difficult one, by the way. Um, so let me just say, uh, I see it's here at, uh, at 12, 12.50. And I doubt I'm going to get to um, the topic of uh, some applied research. I'll probably hold another webinar uh, on that another another occasion. Here's, a, here's another couple of key points about what's happening in the world of, of computing and, and technology. Um, Moore's law, which has for about uh, 60 or 70 years held that every 18 months computer chip uh, speed doubled. Um, it has been breaking down around about 2005. Okay, it's a big deal uh, because that is the, the kind of uh, engine that drives the increasingly powerful software that we, we use. Um, what has happened there is that there's a, you know, first after that happened, we moved to like multi-core computers to make up for the, the, the inability to inc increase clock speed in the silicon chip. Um, now we're moving towards what's called application specific integrated circuits. Things like GPUs, graphic processing units are an example of that, okay? They, they happen to be a type of uh, chip architecture which is very well suited to doing a fast machine learning. Uh, with, with these sorts of chips, uh, you don't just um, double the speed in 18 months, you may times the speed of the, of the relevant processing 10 times in 18 months using a particular GPU architecture. What that means is that even though Moore's law in, in its general form is petering out, because it's been recognized that fast machine learning chips are absolutely critical. Basically, fast chip means more intelligence, to put it very simplistically. There is a, a concerted effort from the chip engineers, computer engineers, and so forth to build specifically fast chips. They're generally considered what's called general purpose GPUs, GP, GPUs. Um, they can be quite expensive, 5,000 or more, $8,000 per chip, uh, but they are um, particularly even exceeding Moore's law in their rate of progress. So now that we know we need fast machine learning chips, we're making them even faster than, than Moore's law. So it suggests that um, the AI breakthroughs are going to be even accelerated beyond what we're already seeing. And here's another, another maybe a, another final uh, observation on, on where this is all going. This is a, a non-exact non quote from a guy called Jeffrey Hinton. Jeffrey Hinton is, is well known as a uh, probably one of the key founders of this area that I've mentioned called deep learning. Um, the suggestion is that programming itself will be made, programming itself will be made outdated. So what does that mean if you're learning programming? Well, the good news is that, uh, and, and why, why do we say that? Because as I described at the start of the talk, what is actually happening is that as long as you show enough data examples from historical data uh, using machine learning algorithms, they can learn the relationship between inputs and outputs. Roughly, that's what you do when you write software, okay? You, you create methods, you create functions or a whole software, which is, you know, if you receive this input, it should do, you know, appropriate output. Um, with this complexity of machine learning techniques, AI techniques, we're finding that that's going to move up to being able to manage, in fact, um, uh, even programming. But the good news is here that uh, it's actually the real, even before we get anywhere near that, the real obstacle at the moment is having enough skilled people who can even, um, I guess, um, wield these technologies and try to build these systems. All of these are non-trivial. Non You're still in the early, the early stages and that's not even applying in, in detail into each sector. So, you know, you can really see what's happening here is, uh, you know, what's that term, Cambrian explosion. Each of these technologies is going to grow massively based on the, the speed up in, in, in GPUs, um, 
the uh, great attention being given to these uh, machine learning algorithms. And then as you apply each of those into each industry, whether it's entertainment, whether it's health, whether it's autonomous vehicles, each of these will change each of those industries. Okay, so just as you can see, the move to autonomous vehicles will definitely um, up unseat the traditional driver experience. Um, you know, the ability of, of systems to, to automatically create entertainment or, or beautiful pictures or creative works would, would maybe upset a lot of artists as well. Uh, but you're going to find that happening everywhere. So what else do we have here? Uh, do we have AI ML framework for effective AI ML tools to migrate weaponized AI mitigate weaponized AI malware attacks. Um, you know, this is what I want to talk about today, literally the, the question of um, uh, you know, malware detection, something we're doing research on. Feel free to drop me an email and I'll give you some of the, the papers we're working on specifically with that. I can say this, that, um, that uh, the idea of adversarial training that you have in generative adversarial networks that I, I mentioned in passing in the, in the, in the space of creating creative works um, is very relevant to uh, training up uh, virus or malware or, or, um, or, or a malicious code detection. Literally, uh, literally, you can have an automated arms race there, but uh, even in the area of what we call malware detection, it's a very rich, um, a rich space. Uh, I see a note here from, from Bill saying we have two minutes. Um, any other questions? questions that people would like to to ask i see we're at 1256 um, i'm very happy to discuss any of these ideas so the, the key point i've mentioned here is that um, the key point i've mentioned here is that uh, machine learning can automatically find uh, the relationships uh, not always accurately because there's not always enough information in the actual uh, data set uh, between any inputs and outputs that covers anything that covers the future that covers uh, human reasoning tasks um, and maybe just a final observation here in the past big discoveries like newton's newton's uh, laws of, of motion they just discovered that there was a relationship between mass and velocity and momentum. And so these were very important. They changed, changed the world. Um, but Newton never came up with the relationships between, say, 10,000 different variables. Um, because when you start to deal with, even scientists can only kind of conceive of to think about the relationships between a limited number of variables. Say that the actual interesting relationship was between 10,000 different variables. A person can never come up with that relationship. Uh, so what this means is machine learning can, without any particular obstacle uh, on, on sufficiently powerful hardware, so what this means is it's going to open up the ability to find um, essentially all the relationships that exist in our physical world uh, and, our, and our human systems that no human could ever have analytically come up with. So, you know, that is very, very big. And that's why this is not a five-year, um, that's not a five-year uh, trend. That is something that's going to, you know, it's not just about autonomous vehicles. Um, this is the part of the talk I was going to get up to some of our own research, um, prediction of patient outcomes, malware detection, and autonomous vehicle work. Uh, but with 12.59, I know Bill wants me to, to wrap up. Um, what are the other questions here? Dr. Steele, I think what we'll do is there are many other questions. I can see them uh, as well is uh, we're going to officially wrap up now, uh, but then if you don't mind, we'll stay on for a few minutes after the conclusion of the official webinar uh, to answer any questions for people that are still interested. And also uh, if you can get your email, there it is, rjsteele at captechu.edu. Exactly, uh, so I'm, I'm happy, thank you, but I'm happy to stay on for a few minutes. And, and for anyone who's not gonna be around, that is my, my email address and I'd, be, I'd welcome individual emails about any of these topics. Good. So, uh, Dr. Steele, if you can give uh, me back control of the slides uh, and I will, um, there we go. Okay, let me share my screen. 
we are almost done. And um, can you see can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, let me start my video as well. I wanted to just uh, wrap up real quickly. As I said before, if you are still interested and want to uh, continue to dialogue with Dr. Steele, that is fine. We want to let those people go that need to let go. I wanted to talk about the final webinar in the Impact on Emergence, uh, Emerging Technology on Society series. It's a week from today. Uh, and it is on Tuesday, November 24th. That's a Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Uh, it'll be with construction safety advancements, protecting workers through technology and innovation and presented by our chair of safety, Dr. Linda Martin. Uh, construction uh, work is among the most dangerous jobs in the United States. In fact, three of the 10 most dangerous jobs are all related to construction. What are we doing to keep these workers safe and uh, our industries moving? And that's what we'll be covering in that uh, webinar next week. We also have two upcoming CapTech webinars. As you remember, we have two different series of webinars and the CapTech uh, talks um, are on Fridays. And so on this Friday, November 20th, Dr. Dennis Beatty will be presenting on vulner vulnerability management. And then on uh, Friday, December 4th, Dr. Bradford Sims, the president of Capital Technology University will present on our brand new online Bachelor of Science degree in Professional Trades Administration. For this or for the other series, uh, you can uh, access it by going to captechu.edu slash webinar hyphen series. You can learn more about all of these webinars and register if you will. Okay, now I want to answer a question that Merlene had here and because as we conclude, uh, watch uh, for a follow-up email that includes how to get your participation certificate and that is available if you watch this live or if you view it on demand and also we'll send a link to the webinar recording as well as a copy of the slides and that will all come if you've registered for this webinar we will make sure that you get this and we invite you to re-watch it again there's a lot of content that it was covered in this last hour uh, so we invite you to do that we will now officially be done. We are officially over. You may log out at any time, but as uh, we've mentioned already, uh, Dr. Steele will remain online as I will. I won't be answering any questions, but uh, he'll remain online for a few more minutes to try to collect any of these questions. If your questions were not answered and you wish to stay online, go ahead and repost them again so we know that you're still there listening. And I, I'm now going to control, uh, return control, excuse me, back to Dr. Steele to uh, conduct uh, about five or six more minutes of Q&A. Thank you. Back to you, Dr. Steele. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Bill. I did just answer a question from uh, Pancham about the most popular languages for machine learning. Uh, there's no doubt that the number one at this 